Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to begin today's program by introducing the F.A. Hayek Memorial Lecture. Dr. Robert Murphy earned his Ph.D. in economics from NYU in 2003. He then served as visiting assistant professor of economics at Hillsdale College in Michigan. From 2006 to 2007, he was employed as a research and portfolio analyst with Laffer Associates, an economic and investment consultancy firm. Currently, he offers private economic consulting services, including commodity forecasting, monetary exchange data, and trade policy analysis. Dr. Murphy is an adjunct scholar and frequent speaker at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. He writes a column for townhall.com and has also written for lourockwell.com. He is an adjunct scholar at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy and economist for the Institute for Energy Research. He has published three books, including Chaos Theory, the Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism, and most recently, The Pol Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression. He has also designed a home study course in Austrian economics and the study guide for Murray Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State, bo both of which are published by the Mises Institute. He will address us today on the subject of pattern coordination and the theory of interest. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Murphy. Well, thanks for that introduction, Joe. Thank you all for coming. Um, when, when Joe invited me to give this lecture, he said in the email, uh, I said, yeah, this is the, the named Hayek lecture, so you know, you want, I want you to talk about your research and as it pertains to the, to the work of Hayek. And so, of course, my first thought was, well, I've been a consultant for four years. What do you mean research? What is that? Um, and what I'm, what I'm going to do, though, is, is go back to my, uh, my dissertation, the third chapter from that, and uh, talk about it. And in the beginning, I'm going to go off on what will seem like a tangent to you just to lay the foundation, but I promise I'm, I am going to come back and I will uh, make it pertain to the, to the work of Hayek. And uh, also, I'm going to stop at around 45 after to turn over Q&A, because this I'm hoping this is going to be controversial to some of you, that I am going to be challenging the, the pure time preference theory of interest, or at least the certain expositions of it. And so, um, like I said, I just... Just hold tight, and you know you, you might get antsy halfway through, but don't worry, we'll come back, and I'll allow you to, to voice your displeasure, okay? Um, also, uh, David Gordon fed me a few jokes beforehand. One of them I can actually tell. He, he said, uh, he, told, he told me to get up here and tell you that an economist is someone who didn't have the personality to become an accountant. And, uh, and then he told me another one about Liberace, which you'll have to ask me about afterwards. Okay. You know, it's piano jokes. All right. So let's see. The, uh, so we, what I'm actually talking about. Okay, so where this is coming from, this is uh, chapter three of my dissertation, and it's um, a monetary approach to interest theory. And what, what that means is in contrast to a real approach. Because okay, the Austrians, pure time preference theory, it's a real approach to interest, meaning we're not, we don't think about it in terms of money. When we say, well, you know, what's interest about the Austrians, boom, they go right into, oh, it's time preference. They talk about present goods are more valuable than future goods, and you never even talk about money after the first sentence, right? So what I'm saying here is I don't think we should do that. I think maybe that's wrong. Maybe it's more realistic, and we'll see. We don't lose anything if we acknowledge, no, what interest is, it is has to do with money, right? That what you're doing in, a, in an interest exchange, the nominal rate of interest is saying, if I lend you a certain amount of money today, how much are you gonna pay me back? Or an equivalent way is to say, it's the price of renting money, right? And that to, so, to some Austrians steeped in the, I'm gonna say PTPT for pure time preference theory. Um, Austrians coming from that tradition, a lot of, like to even say interest is about the rental price of money, that, that would, you know, that's anathema. That no, 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 it's not about money at all, it's about real goods and, and you're missing the boat, they would say. You're missing the essence of interest. So again, I just want to, that, that's where I'm going with, with this uh, analysis here. Um, this, I don't have the URL for you, but if you, if you Google, you know, my dissertations online, I actually get people at the, at the Jekyll Island conference, a guy came up to me. He's like, Dr. Murphy, I read your dissertation. I said, oh, that makes eight of us. Um, <laughs> and, and then I said, you know, of course, did you understand it? And if he says yes, then I say, okay, they, they, you know, you're different from my committee then. Um, and... <laughs> Now, if they, if they see this on, online, I mean, they can't take away my PhD, right? Like, I'm, okay, then I don't have to apologize. Um, so, 
so anyway, this, this is online if you want to go see it. Now, the, the chapter two of the dissertation is a critique of the pure time preference theory, whereas this is, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of giving you, like, what, what, what could Austrians use instead of it? And I realized before, I, I don't think I've, when I was trying to decide what to talk about today, the re, part of the reason I, I settled on this is I don't think I've presented on this material from this chapter three. I've, I've talked about at least in informal sessions about you know my problems with the pure time preference theory, and I think I even you know tried to get it, it published, and and I, and I was it was hitting a brick wall, and I and I realized part of the problem is you can't beat something with nothing. That it's fine to sit there and, and criticize the problems with what I think are Mises' exposition of the PTPT. Um, again, for people coming in late, I'm not talking about uh, TPs, things that you know people, Native Americans live. I'm talking about pure time preference theory, PTPT. Um, I just realized if someone came in late, they would the whole lecture. They have no clue what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so so anyway, that's uh, so I realized it's it's hard if you're criticizing something and people could say, okay, yeah, 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 but so what? So now I'm, I'm hoping maybe if I show you the alternative, like this is a completely consistent Aust Austrian way to think about interest theory that doesn't you know violate subjectivism or anything. I, in my opinion, this is actually more Austrian, if you will. Than the PTPT. So anyway, that's that's partly why I chose this is because I don't think in this crowd I've ever actually shown you you know what can we do if we throw out the PTPT. Okay, so let me um, first of all just just very briefly just give you a few problems with so-called real theories of interest of which the PTPT is just one uh, example. So the first thing, and again, all this stuff I'm kind of saying from an Austrian point of view. All right, so a lot of the criticisms I'm gonna raise a mainstream economist wouldn't care, but I'm saying Austrians ought to care about these things. So the first thing is that to even use a real theory of interest, you have to have in mind some sort of constancy or stationarity of the situation, either of the economy itself, the conditions of production, or of preferences. So let me uh, just give you an example. I was going to cover it up with something that has words on it. Let me see. There we go. Okay, I just want you to look at that table. Okay, so I, in case you can't see it in the back, it says, you know, one present apple for one present orange, one present apple, two future apples, and so on. The bottom one there is one future apple for one quarter future oranges. So what this is, this, the situation I have in mind here is a real simple economy. There's apples and oranges, two periods. And the story behind this is in the first period, the supplies of apples and oranges are such that the spot price is one to one. All right, so if you want to think that there's the same amount of apples and oranges and people you know, don't have a preference for one versus the other, other things being equal, you can do that, but you don't need to. The point is apples and oranges trade one for one in the first period. If you want to think of it in terms of money, you know, the, the spot price of apples is a dollar a pound in the first period and the spot price of oranges is a dollar a pound, okay? So they trade one for one. And then people know in, in period one, they can see this coming, so it doesn't take them by surprise. They know the supply of apples is going to go up in the future, and they know the supply of oranges is going to go down. All right, so maybe there's some kind of blight that affects orange trees, but not apple trees, and, and they can see in period one that this is coming, so it's not a surprise. So these are equilibrium, arbitrage-free exchange ratios, and you know I'm not going to prove it to you here, but there's you can't make a pure profit in this environment. You know, you can't do an arbitrage and, and buy apples in one period and, and futures and do something to make money risklessly. Okay, so the question is, what is the real rate of interest in this economy? And I'm going to say it's, it's undefined. You don't know. If you look at it in terms of, because what does what the pure time preference theorist usually say? He says, oh, the real rate of interest refers to the premium on present versus future consumption. So how many uh, future goods does a present good trade for? Okay. So here, if you just looked at the apples, you'd say, oh, the real interest rate's 100%. You give up one present apple, you, you know, there's different ways you can think about it. You can say you sell it for money and then lend the money out, and then in period two, you would get enough money back to buy two apples at that point. So you gave up, in period one, you gave up one apple to get two apples delivered in period two. Or if there's futures markets, in period one, you give up one apple, and that has the same market value as two claims on a future apple. And you see that here because uh, the second line from the bottom, one, whoops, sorry, no, let's see. The, uh, the second line from the top, sorry, one present apple trades for two future apples, right? That's 
what that means. Okay, so there, no problem yet. Present goods are more valuable than future goods. And you say, okay, but if you looked at oranges, it's the opposite. The real rate of interest would be negative 50%. All right, and so, now again, I, know I, see, I can see some of you getting antsy, and you're saying, but they're different goods, right? I, I know, just, just wait, I'm gonna come back. Um, so the point is, you, here, you couldn't point to the premium on present goods, because it's different across goods. And, and I just exaggerated, of course, to, to throw in a negative number, but if it weren't that, like, what if I had something more plausible, like there was a 10% premium on apples and a 9% premium on oranges, then what would the real rate of interest be? What would the premium on present goods be? And it wouldn't be obvious how you would compute it. Okay, now in Rothbard and Mises, is there a robot that's getting mad at me? Okay. Um, in Rothbard and Mises, the way they deal with this is they say that there will emerge a uniform rate of uh, return, right? That they'll say if investors could earn more in one line of goods in terms of like the real rate of return uh, in that line, you know, the, um, the, the, the rate of interest in terms of the goods themselves, then they would shift into that line that would, what would that do? That would push up the, the present price and it would push down the future price, okay? And so that, that would even it out. Right, so that's the that's they say that there were in you know in equilibrium there would be a uniform premium on present versus future consumption across all lines, but that's only true. <coughs> excuse me, that's only true in an evenly rotating economy. Okay, because here again, that's not that there's a surprise here. It's just the conditions change specifically, and I have to move on because there's a lot of ground I need to cover here. But specifically, what's going on is the spot price of apples and oranges changes from period one to period two. Whereas Rothbard, when he goes through and tries to prove that you know entrepreneurs seeking profits will tend to iron out all the differences, that only is true, or that, that proof requires the fact that the spot prices of all the goods are the same period after period. And so if that, yeah, if you're in the evenly rotating economy, it's true there will emerge um, you know, just one rate of, of premium on present over future consumption. Okay, so, that's the issue here. So again, what's my point? That to even talk about the, a real theory of interest, you have to have some sort of constancy in mind. So in this case, the constancy I'm pointing out is Austrians are thinking that spot prices are the same, or at least the, the ratio of spot prices on real goods are the same period after period. That's just a necessary component in their exposition. And if you said to them, okay, but what about an economy that's not an evenly rotating economy, but everything is perfectly anticipated. So stuff's changing. You know, you can see there's going to be a blight or whatever. You, you run out of diamonds over time or, you, or coal runs out over time. And so the price of coal goes up as we go decades into the future, as, as the supply dwindles. But we see all that coming. So we're not talking about pure profit. And then how do you discuss the real rate of interest in that world? And it gets pretty tricky pretty quickly because that's, Austrians aren't equipped to deal with that. They talk about the rate of interest in the evenly rotating economy. Okay, now one thing that mainstream economists will do, and I'll, I'll just go over this very briefly, the way a mainstream economist deals with that issue I just talked about is they'll construct a, a consumption basket. So they'll say, yeah, if you just define apples as the consumption good, then the real interest rate is 100%. And if oranges is the consumption good, then it's negative 50. But you can just say something like pick a unit of consumption, like one apple and one orange, and that's your basket. That's defining the price level. And then I think in that, with those numbers, it would be like negative 20% would be the, the real interest rate. All right. But again, even there, you run into problems because you, what if happens if there's, there's new goods over time? So for example, in, the, in the, the chapter I talk about, suppose you got somebody who saves up for 10 years. You know, He works, he gets income. He puts it in the bank, it builds up, and then after the 10th year, he goes and buys the latest computer, like you know, the cutting edge line of his favorite brand of computer, he buys the newest model. It's hard to even think of you know, the, the exchange there, the, you know, giving up present consumption for a future good, which is what he's doing for the 10 years that he's saving. He's postponing potential present consumption in exchange for what at that time is gonna be a future good but that future good doesn't even, it's not even available until the day he buys it, if he buys it when it first comes out. Okay, so you see there, it's, it's you get, I can't go into it here, but it's, it's really, even philosophically, it gets a little bit weird when you're trying to 
to compare things when, when the, the composition of the consumption basket changes over time. Okay, so again, I'm just pointing out you get into trouble if you try to think about interest as a real phenomenon as opposed to, no, interest is, has to do first and foremost with money it changing hands intertemporally. Okay, another way, let me to try to get you to see where I'm coming from when I say that this is, in my mind, it's more Austrian to look at interest as having to do with money, is look at this quote from David Laidler. I'm going to read it because I realize you're not going to be able to see it in the back. I'll have to do that. Zoom preset? I'm just going to read it. Okay, you can't see it. I'm going to read it. All right, and so this is David later. In the economics of Keynes, as in classical economics, money was a means of exchange, and textbook macroeconomics even now refers to transactions and precautionary motives for holding money, which are said to derive directly from that role. However, when monetary economists adopted Walrasian general equilibrium as their basic vision of economic activity, they adopted a model that could not generate such motives internally. The monetarist counter-revolution did nothing to interrupt the process of integrating monetary theory with Walrasian value theory. The further this process was pushed, the more the representative model of a monetary economy came to resemble one of a barter economy in which there happened to be a peculiar asset called money whose real, in other words, utility yielding quantity varied in inverse proportion to its price in terms of goods. The utility in question was said to arise from money's role as a means of exchange, of course, but there was no such role for it to play within the logical structure of the representative macroeconomic model. Okay, so there, Lather is, is criticizing mainstream economics macro models, where, I mean, for those of you who have studied these things, you, you know exactly what he's talking about, that it is a, it's a barter economy. There's usually a representative agent, they have utility function, but then they want to put in, you know, and the, and the uh, uh, agent knows all the prices and he knows the structure of the model. If there's uncertainty, it's just, you know, some random variable and he knows the distribution of it and that sort of thing. So there's rational expectations. And then, but the problem is, if they want to discuss, you know, central banking policy, they have to have money in the model, right? So, and so how do they get it in there? They'll just put some good, they'll call some good the numeraire and then they'll, they will say, well, you know, let's just assume that holding this thing gives the agent a flow of utility that they get utility from having this thing as part of their cash balances in the same way that if you had to model an agent buying a painting, you know, that's, you, you just have that as a parameter in the utility function and just say, well, the more paintings they have, you know, hanging around their house and their possession, the happier they are. So they're willing to sell labor hours to, to acquire these things. Okay. So that's the point that in the world of the model, there's really no reason they, they need to have money. All right. And, and I think if I, if you didn't know the context here, and I were just making fun of mainstream economics, talking about this, you'd all be agreeing with me and say, yeah, you're right, that's silly, that, that they don't understand why people are holding money the way we Austrians do, and their models, there's not even a role for money. And so that's the problem with mainstream economics, is they make a bunch of assumptions and then try to talk about central banking policy in a world where money doesn't serve any function. So of course, the answers are gonna be nonsense. But what I'm saying is that's what the Austrians are doing with interest, that you're, you're thinking of it in terms of an evenly rotating economy, and you're thinking of it in terms of, you know, you're not even dealing with money. And so that, you know, the world in which the Austrians think to, to think through the implications for interest theory is a world where you wouldn't need money. And so that's a little bit weird that, you know, what does money have to do with? Well, surely it has something to do with, you know, money and interest are, have to do, do with each other because, you know, interest is the, the rate of return on money when you lend it. And so the way I summarize it, I say that the, uh, Looking at the world in terms of a barter economy always abstracts away from one side of real world transactions, right? That in mainstream economics, when we use, you know, compute marginal rates of substitution and so on and solve price ratios without having money actually in the model, you know, that abstracts from the real world on one half of, the, of each side of every transaction because in the real world, you're usually, you know, buying a real good for money. But when, it, when you do that with interest, it's abstracting from both sides. Because in interest in the real world, you're giving up money in exchange for future money. And so it's really odd if you're analyzing that with a model where money doesn't even play a role. Okay? All right. So now, so we see what my concerns are with the, the real approach. So what would it look like for a monetary approach? Well, let me talk about 
again, I'm gonna, it's going to seem like I'm going off on a tangent here, but, but just trust me, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be relevant. I want to go on an excursus on subjectivist methods. So I just want to walk us through some familiar examples and how we use subjective value theory or price theory, and then we'll see that the way we use it in, a, in an intratemporal context is, is inconsistent with how Austrians use it intertemporally, okay? So the first thing is, let's say we've got two different goods. Okay, so a physicist comes along and there's these two things, these two distinct items, and he says, I've done the measurements, and that first thing, it's 8.01 ounces of spring water. And then he said, and that other thing over there, that's 8.02 ounces of spring water. And so the physicist wants to say, those are different things. But as an economist, we know those could be the same good, right, because the consumer, as long as, you know, the consumer doesn't really distinguish between those, those decimal points, if you follow what I'm saying, right, that... You know, if you're holding up two bottles of water to a consumer and they might think the same thing, it, it doesn't matter if a physicist comes along and says, no, actually, they're different, you're right? Okay, because again, it, it matters, it's, it's in the consumer's head. All right, and the same thing, if you have, you know, if you're, if you're trying to, as a social scientist, understand what's happening at a Catholic service and a chemist comes along and he said, you know, they're holding up this chalice of wine and this guy did some stuff, but I analyzed it, and chemically, it was the same before and after, but yet everyone was, was acting different, you know, after he did these motions with his hand, what's going on? And you would say, oh, because these people, you know, have certain beliefs, and they think that something changed, this, you know, what, this, what, what, the, what was wine turned into something more sacred to them, and so it doesn't matter that you can't see any physical difference, you know, that to them, in their minds, it is a different thing now. And so, you know, they, they, would, be, they would, you know, sacrifice something much more, to preserve the thing after it's been blessed than beforehand, okay? So again, trying as a social scientist, trying to understand their actions, we see in both cases, it's not the physical characteristics, it's what's in the people's heads, okay? This is standard stuff. But you might say then, okay, so if something is, uh, you, you, from, the, from the wine example, turning into, in Catholics' minds, you know, turning into the blood of Christ, you might say, okay, so if something has different amounts of value, then they're different goods to the, to the people subjectively, but, but you've got to be careful because what about this example? Okay, the, the nth unit of water as opposed to the n plus one unit of water. Okay, now in standard Austrian theory, you know, the marginal utility of the, that second thing is lower than of the first. And so in that sense, they're different goods, but yet they're both units of the same good. They're subsequent units, okay? So what I'm saying is, we, you know, how do we distinguish between saying the fifth gallon of water versus the sixth gallon of water as opposed to saying the fifth gallon of water compared to a diamond ring? Because those are clearly different goods too. And if you said, well, why? You know, you say, well, it has something to do with subjective valuation, and the same thing, though, with you know, the fifth versus the sixth gallon of water. Why are they different? Well, it has something to do with subjective valuation, but yet there's a sense in which the fifth and sixth gallons of water are the same good. They're just different units of the same good, whereas the gallon of water and the diamond ring, they're totally different goods. Okay, so you know, what, how do you resolve this? What, what's, what's the common element through all this? And I want to say, I propose in the... a swap test, meaning if you could take these two things that might be physically distinct, that a chemist or a physicist could point out the differences and just swap them, that the consumer wouldn't care, all right? So when you have, you know, one gallon of water that's devoted to drinking and a different gallon of water that's devoted to, uh, you know, washing dishes, technically they're not the same thing, right? That the physicist could say, actually, this is 1.01 gallons and this is 1.02 but as long as the consumer wouldn't mind if you switched them so that this water over here now is the one devoted to drinking and this is the one devoted to washing dishes, the consumer doesn't care, 
That's the sense in which they're different units of the same good. It doesn't mean, of course, that the consumer values the first and the second gallons the same because the drinking is more important. But the idea is that the different physical things, if they're equally serviceable for the same ends, then that's what we mean when we say they're either different units of the same good or they're entirely different. Okay. So again, this is all standard stuff, and I think you know you agree that yeah, that's that's what we have in mind when we're, we're talking about this. Okay, so then we're getting close to the relevance to interest theory. Don't worry. So now the issue is, let's think about a different example. What about this one? Okay, an orange in Maine versus an orange in Florida. And so here, the context I have in mind, standard free market economics, you know, you have somebody complaining about middlemen. And they'll say, oh, these people, you know, they, they, they rip off the farmer because they buy, you know, the, the, the good is, is the orange the farmer grows. He puts his labor into it and so forth. And they buy it in Florida for a certain price. And then they take the same thing, they move it up to Maine, and they charge a huge markup. And they're ripping consumers off, and they should be paying the farmer more and charging the consumer less. So as a free market economist, what do we say to that? The obvious thing is those are different goods. An orange in Maine is not the same thing as an orange in Florida, and a guy in Maine is willing to pay more for an orange in Maine than you know, a claim to an orange that's all the way down in Florida, because obviously he can eat the thing that's sitting right there in Maine, but he can't eat the one in Florida. Okay, so again, these are different goods, but if we push it, they're different goods, but they're not different, or they're different in a different way. Right, those comparisons that, yeah, an orange in Maine is also a different good from a diamond in Florida, but yet, you see, there's a sense in which those are more different, if you will, than the, the first two things. Okay, so again, I want to propose what we have in mind is that swap test where, you know, what, what, what we mean is those first two things are saying they're both oranges, and again, it's not that they're the physically the same orange in terms of the atoms and whatever, that, no, what we mean is you have an orange in Maine, and a different physical thing that's down in Florida, and if we somehow magically swap them, and then the consumer wouldn't care. You know, he's about to eat his orange for lunch in Maine, and we swap that physical thing with another sphere that's down in Florida, and he wouldn't notice a difference. That's the sense in which we're saying, okay, we're talking about the same oranges, and the only difference is this one is in Maine in your hand, and the other one's down in Florida. Okay, so what we're doing is we're holding everything except the geographical location constant. And that's the sense in which we're saying it's the same good, but for the location. And then we say, yeah, once you factor in the difference in location, they are different goods. There's no doubt about that. But they're the same good except for that. Whereas the diamond in Florida and the orange in Maine are also completely different goods. But there's a sense in which, you know, if you swapped them, obviously, you know, if you want to eat something, you're not going to eat the diamond ring. And of course, you can go sell the diamond ring or give it to your wife or whatever. And she's going to be a lot happier than if you give her an orange, right? So... And I've, I've tried that for my anniversary, and, and believe me. Um, okay, so you, you see, you see the, the issue here, okay? And again, I'm just walking through this. Now, I just want to point something out. It would never come up in this discussion when you're trying to argue with somebody who's a complaint about middlemen and you're trying to explain what subjectivist value theory says. You would never, ever be comparing the psychic satisfaction and asking the person, would you rather eat an orange in Maine? And you're picturing that you know, how it tastes in that psychic experience versus you being down in Florida and eating an orange down there, right? That never comes up. Here, the person is always in Maine. It's the same person, same value scale. And the question is just you right here in Maine, do you want an orange here in Maine or do you want a claim to an orange that's, you know, thousands of is it a thousand miles away? I'm bad at geography. I don't know. Very far away. Okay. You see what I'm saying? You're never asking the person, would you rather eat the orange here in Maine or would you rather be down in Florida eating the orange down there? That's not really relevant to this kind of issue, okay? So now the connection with the pure time preference theory, the way Austrians usually talk about that, is you know, a standard, so let me back up, make sure I'm not losing some of you. The Austrians say present goods are more valuable than future goods. And then there's all sorts of obvious counterexamples that come up and people will say something like, 
you know, okay, well, if you're talking to a guy in the winter and you said, you want some ice cream now or do you want it next August? He might choose the August ice cream because, you know, for obvious reasons. And, and so isn't that a case of a guy in winter preferring the future good to the present good? And the officer says, no, those are different goods. But what they mean is they're comparing you eating the ice cream there in December versus picturing yourself eating ice cream in August and you're comparing your happiness of that future guy with your happiness right now. So you're doing the equivalent of, you know, saying the guy eating the orange in Florida versus the guy eating the orange in Maine, all right? Um, and so it's, it's again, it's, I, I, I have to move on here, but th that's what I'm getting at, that it's, it's, it gets a little bit weird in the way we have to discuss things. It's, it's not consistent with how we do it in an intratemporal context. To give you a, just an example, and, and this goes back to the earlier point about how you have to assume Constantine preferences. Suppose you're talking to an eight-year-old kid, and you say, hey, do you want uh, a bottle of beer, no, sorry, do you want two bottles of beer now, or do you want one bottle when you're 25 and in college, or sorry, 22 and in college. So hopefully the kid's not still in college when he's 25, right? And if the kid is, you know, if he's a normal kid, not growing up in, in some family like mine, he's an eight-year-old, he's not gonna drink beer, right? Because he's gonna say that's gross, and if he's but if he's wise, he'll say, but you know, I've seen other people, and as they age, they acquire a taste for beer, and so I probably would like beer when I'm 22 and in college, and so yeah, I will take, you know, your claim, your airtight claim right now to a beer when I'm 22. So there, it's really weird, you know. So first of all, the 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 critic of the PTPT might say, well, duh, isn't this an obvious case where the person is preferring the future good? To the They're giving up a claim, or you know, two cans of beer in the present for one years in the future, clearly this person prefers future to present goods. And, you know, and that would be very consistent with the preferring the orange in Maine to Florida, right? You're looking at the same person and just looking, you know, you're holding the, the beer constant. It's not the same bottle of beer, actually. They're different physical things. We're just saying if we swap them across the decades that, you know, to that person, they're the same thing. And, and, and so you see, isn't that clearly example? And how does the PTPT PT theorists get around that. They say, well, no, they're different goods. That, you know, the, su the subjective satisfaction to you in the future is different from right now. But again, there, it's, that's really weird because you're not just allowing time to pass, but you're having to take into account that your preferences themselves will change. And so you're comparing, you're basically doing an interpersonal utility comparison, right? You're comparing the happiness to this one guy today, this eight-year-old kid, and then comparing it to some 22-year-old kid. And so I'm saying, if you're allowed to do that as an Austrian, then why can't we talk about, you know, take it right now, there's an eight-year-old guy here and a 22-year-old guy here, and I give him the beer and him the beer, and I say, oh, he gets more utility from that than this guy does. And as Austrians, we say, no, you can't do that. That's an interpersonal utility comparison. But yet we have to do that in the pure time preference framework to deal with these sorts of examples. Okay. So what I'm proposing then is that if you want to talk about it in terms of interest theory, you can do things like this. You can talk about orange in 2010 versus orange in 2011. And you know, how do, what do we mean by that? It's the same thing we meant with the orange in Maine versus Florida. That in orange in 2010 to say it's the same good except for the difference in time. We just mean if we had the thing right here in 2010 and I'm going to give you a claim to something that that future thing, if we somehow swap them, you right now, you wouldn't care. You would say, yeah, the, you know, I don't mind. Even though it's not that you're actually going to take this orange in 2010 and save it for a year, right? It's going to be a different orange that the person would deliver to you in the future. Okay, so that's the sense in which we're nailing down are these units of the same good? We're not asking your subjective happiness if you ate the orange now versus picture yourself a year from now eating that orange then, and then is that subjective experience the same, and then that's what we mean by saying the same good, which is what the PTPT people have to say. You don't do that at all. You're talking about the same guy, same value scale right now, and you're just saying if you somehow magically had a time machine and switched these things, would they be the same to you? All right, so I'm saying that's consistent with how we deal with stuff in an intratemporal context. And so there, if the person, if you say, now I've given you a choice between these two, which do you prefer? And if the guy says, I want an orange in 2011, then okay, that's an example of a future good being preferred to a present good. And, you know, that's no big deal. The world doesn't blow up. You don't become a communist if you say that. You know, it's not that interest all of a sudden is cast into suspicion. 
You could, you could prefer an orange delivered in 2011 to 2010. What's the big deal? Just like if somebody said, I'd rather get an orange in Flor a claim to an orange in Florida as opposed to one in Maine, that wouldn't upset our price theory. It, it's not like all of a sudden, if someone said that, the income of middlemen would be cast into doubt. We would just say, okay, well, that, that guy has unusual preferences and that's not normal, but typically people prefer goods to be close to them. Right? You wouldn't need to come up with a theory of proximity preference and say other things equal people want goods to be closer than farther away, and that's why middlemen earn an income, and that's why it's justified. You don't need to go into all that. You just talk about people's preferences and say empirically this happens to be the case, and that's why middlemen earn an income. And if, if that weren't the case, if people weren't willing to pay more for goods typically that were available to them in their state than a good that was produced several states away, then the middlemen wouldn't be able to earn that income. You know, so it's not an issue of the government coming in and having to regulate it. So again, I hope you're, you're seeing the analogy there that I can concede that there could be someone who would prefer a future good to a present good, and that doesn't mean all of a sudden I can no longer justify interest payments or explain why the market interest rate is positive. That, you know, that, that's typically what happens. Why is the market interest rate positive? I would say it's because people prefer present money to future money. So they prefer a dollar in 2010 to a dollar delivered in 2011. And um, when you want to focus on what, what do you mean is it the same dollar, again, it's that issue of if you swap them, not look, taking into account you know, your experience or in the future. Okay, so that's where I'm coming from with this. Now let me move on to a, a few other loose ends and then I'll stop it for your questions. So. The, the other thing that I dealt with in the, in the chapter is this notion of radical uncertainty. And again, I know there's certain elements in this that uh, some Rothbardians don't like, but I think there's, there's a lot to be said for this. Uh, I don't agree with everything these people are saying. Some of them, I think, do take it too far to become sort of nihilist, but there, I think there's a, a lot of truth in what they're saying. And I'm not going to be able to develop it here, but it's things like... Um, you know, Hayek has this great quote where he says, the mind cannot foresee its own advance, all right? And um, if, you, if you've seen, the way I would, when I would explain this to undergrads, by this point, usually they would be passed out, and so I'd bring them back. And I said, fortunately, you guys are at least, you're still not nodding off. Um, they, they, he would, they would say, it was in Maxim Magazine, but I think it was, it was elsewhere. I don't think they invented it, but it was it, like, Hayek versus Hayek. So it was Salma Hayek versus Friedrich Hayek. And, you know, they were doing head-to-head -head on various issues. And so one of them was, like, beauty. And they had a picture of Salma and Friedrich. And so the advantage, Salma, right? And then, and then it was going through there. And then one of the, the categories was philosophical depth. And then it said Friedrich. And that's where they had this quote. It said, the mind cannot foresee its own advance. And then for Salma, it said, I want to meet a man who has bigger balls than me. And, um, and then the thing said advantage, Friedrich, you know, so... <laughs> Anyway, I usually got the undergrads that are like, oh, what's this? Okay. <laughs> All right, so, so anyway, so what is he talking about there? I mean, you, again, I'm not going to go into it here, but Karl Popper has some really neat little uh, discussions on this, sort of saying the, the, the insight or the intuition is you can't right now know your future knowledge. You can't predict your future behavior because your future behavior is going to be influenced in part by what your beliefs and knowledge are at that time. So in order for you right now to know for sure what you're going to do in 2011, right now you would have to know your knowledge in 2011, but you can't, you, you can't know your future knowledge because if you did, it would be present knowledge. All right, so is that kind of neat little philosophical trick there? So if you can see that people do learn, well then you obviously, you, you can't predict the future with certainty. Okay, so then, all right, that's, that's a neat little trick. So, so what, what's the relevance here? Well, the relevance comes in Hayek's notion of uh, equilibrium in an intertemporal context. So what is it? It has to do with uh, plan coordination. And so Hayek talks about that, this is the example I used to give. If you're, if you're going to go to a grocery store, for example, and you want to you know, buy some milk, so your plan is, okay, we, I want to make I have a big party tomorrow, people are coming over. And oh, oh, my fridge is empty, so I have to go to the store. I have to buy some milk. I got to buy eggs. I got to buy all this stuff, chips, whatever to put out. All the stuff that you need because you're planning on having this party. And so you're going to go to the store. And so there's a lot of things you're assuming that other people in the economy have done. You're assuming that their plans mesh with yours in some respect. That in order for you to go to the store and you're going down the up, oh, yep, there's some pretzels and here's the eggs and the milk. 
and then you go up and you pay for the stuff. You had to, you're implicitly assuming that there were other people in the economy and their plan was some guy woke up and he said, okay, today I have to drive the 18 wheeler from the warehouse down to the store because I'm delivering a shipment of pretzels, right? Because otherwise, how did those pretzels get on the shelf? Somebody had to have done that. And there's some other, you know, teenager waking up saying, oh man, I'm hungover, but I have to go be, you know, work my shift because I'm the cashier today, right? So the, the kid that's ringing you out, you know, part of their plan was I have to go to work today and work the register, all right? So the idea is what Hayek's talking about is in an intertemporal context, what equilibrium really means, it has to do with plans being in coordination with each other somehow. And so it's not just that you correctly anticipate if it's going to rain or the laws of physics and you know, like, well, gee, if we, if we apply this much heat to the steel, it will become malleable and we can bend it and whatever and, and we can produce these consumer goods. So you need to be able to predict the future that way and to understand the laws of physics, but you also need to predict at least in some respect, what other people are doing. And that's to have true equilibrium, Hayek says in an intertemporal context, there has to be some sort of compatibility or these, these plans have to mesh with each other. Okay, but then you run into a problem of, well, what about this issue, this radical uncertainty where you can't know the future with certainty? So it doesn't that kind of blow up this idea of coordination. And so here, what I did is I drew on the work of Odris, uh, Rizzo and O'Driscoll. Let's see. They talk about this term pattern coordination. So they say pattern coordination makes use of both the original Hayekian compatibility of plans and the distinction between typical and unique aspects of future events. The plans of individuals are in a pattern equilibrium if they're coordinated with respect to their typical features, even if their unique aspects fail to mesh. And so the example they give is two people who are collaborating, two professors collaborating on a, on a book project, and they go and they meet in, in the one guy's office and they discuss you know, like, what are we going to talk about in the book? What theme are we going to stress? That kind of thing. And so Rizzo and O'Driscoll, they say, there has to be some notion of coordination there, that if the one guy thinks they're meeting at 11, you know, in the cafeteria, and the other guy thinks they're meeting at 10 down the student union, the, the meeting's not going to work. There's a, a sense in which we're going to say that's a disequilibrium. But you don't want to push it too far. It's not that Professor Smith knows, oh, what Professor Jones is going to say is this, 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 and this, and then I'm going to answer this, this, and this. Because if they knew that, there's no point in having the meeting, right? That, that, that if they know exactly what the other guy is going to say and what their response is going to be, then there's no point in having the meeting because they already know it. Okay, so what Riz and O'Driscoll are saying is there's a sense in which there's a pattern coordination that, that they can talk about the, the big picture items, the typical features of what does it mean to have a meeting with somebody without drilling down in the specifics of the, the content of, of what was said. Okay, and then I gave a different example of a, of a chess tournament. And I said... You know, for the chess tournament to well organized, whoops, there's my alarm, so I'll, I'll wrap up on, on this point. Um, for the chess tournament to be well organized, it has to be the case that, you know, if, if opponent Jones thinks he's playing opponent Smith at this table at this time, the other guy has to think, you know, the equivalent, the mirror image of that, or else it's not going to work out. But obviously, you know, their, their plans, their coordination couldn't be such that he knows, oh, he's going to open with this move with his, with his pawn and then I'm going to open with this move and so on back and forth. They can't see the full game play out because then they would already know who the winner of the tournament was going to be. All right, so you see that there's, and it, it would defeat the whole point of it. So anyway, the, what I'm saying here is that I use that notion for uh, interest theory in terms of future and present goods, and I say that what happens with money is you, you have these, we can define what, a, what future and present units of money are, and then what does it mean for that market to be in equilibrium? It just means, I, I bring up this, this notion of no regrets, and I say that you know, people set aside a certain amount of cash balances, not because they know exactly what they're going to buy with it. The money you have in your wallet right now, it's not that you have every single penny earmarked for something else that you're going to buy in the future, which is sort of what the pure time preference theory pushes you to say. Pure time preference theory, the reason you want a positive interest payment, the reason you have to, you know, if, if you give up $100 now and someone's going to give you 110 next year, the explanation for that, according to the pure time preference theory, is, oh, because you want to consume now, and so you have to be, you know, paid to compensate you for having to defer your consumption until next year. But I want to say it's also possible that you don't know what, you know, you need that money. It's, it's a liquidity preference. You don't know what you're holding it for but you just know something might come up. Right? And so that sort of deals with this issue of uncertainty. But again, I can, it's not throwing out equilibrium altogether. 
even though you don't know what you're going to spend the money on exactly, there's a sense in which as long as you, know, you don't have any regrets, you could say that I had the correct, the optimal amount of cash balances. Let me just read one more thing and I'll turn open to your questions because I know part of the, the resistance people were giving me when I first came out with this is they were saying, well, isn't your theory Keynesian? And, and yeah, it is in a, in a certain sense, but it, you know, it's sort of like when people get mad at Ron Paul and they say like, oh, so you're, you're, you know, you're justifying the attacks of 9-11 or something. Well, no, I mean, you can understand where these people are coming from without endorsing their policy conclusions. And the same thing here, I'm saying a lot of what Keynes wrote in the general theory, it actually is real deep stuff and it, you understand what he's mad about, but then, you know, look what he did with it. You know, that kind of thing. Like, it doesn't follow then that because he's having these concerns with standard economic theory of his day, that therefore the government should nationalize investment and so on. That's, that's a complete non sequitur. It doesn't follow. So, yeah, there is a sense in which a lot of what I'm doing overlaps with some of the stuff Keynes was talking about. So let me just read you this quote from Keynes, and it's kind of ironic because you'll see that what he's saying sounds very Misesian in a sense. So here's Keynes. It has been supposed that any individual act of abstaining from consumption necessarily leads to and amounts to the same thing as causing the labor and commodities thus released from supplying consumption to be invested in the production of capital wealth. The conviction which runs, for example, through almost all of Professor Pigou's work that money makes no real difference except frictionally and that the theory of production and employment can be worked out, like Mills, is being based on real exchanges with money introduced perfunctorily in a later chapter is the modern version of the classical tradition. Contemporary thought is still deeply steeped in the notion that if people do not spend their money in one way, they will spend it in another. So I like this excerpt because it's combining two things here. On the one hand, it looks like he's saying, you know, you can have saving that doesn't lead to investment, and we know that, that we don't like that because we, we think that, oh, that's going to justify government deficit spending, and so we, we, we clam up. But on the other hand, he's complaining about people who look at the economy as you know, real exchanges and then only later introduce money as an afterthought. And he even uses the phrase, looking money, you know, just viewing it as a friction. And that's, remember, I mean, Mises complained about that about Bombaver, right? So that's a very Misesian thing to be mad when, when theorists abstract away from money and just look at the economy as, as real exchanges and don't really have a role for money as its own driving force. Okay, so I'm saying that that's what Keynes is talking about in the context of interest. And so rather than just saying, oh, well, that's Keynesian, I don't care about it, I say, well, maybe we should, we should look at that and say, yeah, money, the driving force of money and so forth, and money is its own thing, and don't just introduce it perfunctorily in a later chapter after we work out the real interest rate. Okay, so I'll stop there and turn over to your questions. Yeah, David? Okay, in, in principle, I'm supposed to summarize what David just said. Uh, I, let me very quickly, I, he, let me just, so he's, he's made this point to me. Right here, it wasn't striking me, David, but I know at lunch last summer, like you got me to see what you were saying, and I, and I agreed with you. I think what you're saying is that Karl Popper's argument, it's, it's not that he proved that we don't know future knowledge. It was just, he was, it's sort of a, a conditional thing. Like if, if you had someone who was a complete determinist, and you know who thought the future was already set in stone. Like there's there's nothing ruling out that possibility. And so it, I think the, what David is saying is, is is Popper and the Popperians thought that that argument proves more than it really does. So I guess my response would just be, I think there's a sense in which we all agree people do learn over time, 
And, and so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're sort of just pointing to the, the counter example that we think exists. Yep. Okay, so the question is, what is money? And I guess uh, I was thinking, at least in the Austrian tradition, I would say money is a, a universally accepted medium of exchange. That's the pat answer, um, and and so it's. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess that would be my answer. Is there some reason that if we go with your route, it? No, I mean, it just keeps score. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, okay. So he's saying it's a way of keeping score, collecting information. So that I'm not saying you're wrong. I mean, mainstream economists for some mainstream economists think that. I'm saying typically Austrians wouldn't because they want to say there you're abstracting from the the contribution money plays because it's money that. It's not just that you can just define something as a numeraire and say these all exchanges would have normally happened anyway, and we can just you know pick well, let's pick gold and price everything in terms of gold, or pick you know sheep and price everything in terms of sheep, which is what they do in a mainstream model. Whereas Austrians normally would say, well, no, I mean gold actually serves a function. You know, they're, they're, the economy is different because people started using money than if they if they never used money. That it, it allows people to discover you know, trilateral exchanges and things to avoid the problem of the double coincidence of want. So the, the money serves a purpose. It's not just uh, a numeraire that allows us to keep score as to what would have happened in the real economy, that the presence of money actually changes things. Yeah, Paul. Huh? Huh? I'm getting nervous. You're looking like you're about to blow me up. <laughs> and that's all the time we have for today. Obviously. Okay. Um, okay. Again, to summarize, if you couldn't pick that up, um, saying the the orange. He, my example involved a guy in Maine preferring, if, hypothetically, if some guy in Maine, you said to him, "Here's a claim to an orange in Florida, or here's an actual orange right now in Maine. Which do you prefer?" If for some reason he picks the one that's in the claim to the orange in Florida. I want to say that doesn't all of a sudden not, now we're incapable of defending the income of middlemen, um, people who you know truck oranges from Florida up to Maine, and then Paul is asking me, well, don't we don't I need to give you more information? Don't we need to dig in deep to why does he prefer the one in Florida? And I want to say, no, that I don't I don't think so. I mean, if we weren't in this discussion, I don't think it would have occurred to anyone to challenge me there and to say, well, why does he prefer the? You wouldn't care. I mean, why does he prefer the or in the normal case where you say he prefers the one in Maine to Florida? What if he wanted it? What if he's a uh, runs a deli and he w uses it to make orange juice? Well, there it's a capital good, and or if he just wants to eat it for lunch, it's a consumption good. But I mean that that doesn't really matter why he preferred one or the other. The question was just do you prefer this or not? So yeah, I mean it, for other reasons, if we want to dig into why does he prefer it in terms of his, his subjective plans, we could do that. But no one ever would have thought to, to challenge me on the you know the. If I had told you he prefers it in Maine to Florida, 
I'm, I'm going to move on. You can, you can argue with me later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, first of all, let me say that uh, this is, I mean, I'm used to giving lecture to like business people and whatever, I talk about the Austrian business cycle, and they have no clue what I'm talking, their questions are real, you know, I just knock them out of the park, these questions are really tough. Um, uh, the, uh, okay, so he's asking me, am I saying the interest is just a monetary phenomenon, like what happens in a barter economy before money emerges, and you know, there's people that, if you could see that there's, a premium on present apples versus future apples, isn't there, don't I want to say, yeah, that's kind of what's going on in our monetary economy, it's just now that money's overlaid on that, or you know, money might change it, but surely there's some real component to it. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, let me just weasel out and say, I'm not sure, I, I don't want to deny that, but I'm saying it works through money, okay, that, that yeah, I, there are, you know, you don't want to just hold money just for its own sake. You, you want to use money to go buy stuff. So I'm agreeing that there's ultimately your preferences for the real commodities in different time periods. That certainly plays a role. But I want to just say that what is interest first and foremost is an exchange rate of present for future money. And you said, you know, the apple for the future apple. Yeah, but I would say at best that's the interest rate on apples. That again, what if in that same economy the, the own rate of interest on pears is different? You know, one of the apples is 10% and pears is 8%, and you want to say, okay, but what's the interest rate? And I don't know. I can only define it in terms of, of money. And I think Mises even says somewhere, like when it comes to, you know, calculation and things like that, that I want, I mean, tell me, like, is it true you can really, profit only really makes sense if there's money? Is that right? Okay. I mean, even though you can, in a sense, a Robinson Crusoe world, you can, you can, there's some analog that clearly there's an issue of using resources effectively, but I think Austrians pushed to the wire would say, Profit doesn't really make sense in a world without money, and I want to say interest. Yeah, there's there's ghosts of it, if you will, in a, in a barter economy. But I think it really only makes sense because what we mean by interest is it's it's the price of renting money. Okay, one more. Uh, yes, sir. Uh huh. Okay, that's a good question. So the question was, doesn't Mises say the interest rate coordinates, uh, you know, first order, second order goods, that kind of stuff, and then when the Fed comes in and screws with the interest rate, doesn't that lead to the business cycle? Yeah, you're, you're right. I'm just going to concede that point. Part of my trouble is here is I don't want to give up the, the, you know, the real Austrian business cycle theory, that there we, we're talking about coordinating real things and we're not really even talking about money so much. And so, yeah, I, I don't want to let Bernanke off the hook. But again, I think it's, um, it's a more nuanced thing. That there, there are lots of issues with liquidity and so forth. One last thing, and I'll, and I'll stop, is uh, the, the Austrians, that when we talk about, oh, what if all of a sudden people became really impatient? The interest rate should go up, right? And the Austrians, but what, I want to say, what if people all of a sudden become really uncertain about the future and their liquidity preference goes up, or if you want to use some other non-Keynesian term, go ahead, then the nominal interest rate could spike too. And if you're an Austrian PTPT PT theorist, you're having to say, oh, I guess all of a sudden people became really impatient. And that's, that's not really what's going on there. Okay, I'll stop. Thanks.